last time we discussed the difficulties that are inherent to our present historical situationness in terms of learning in Aqida, something very foreign to our modern sensibilities anyway, seems like a kind of dogmatic process. And then we're told, you know, there are proofs of, the proofs of this that you can learn in about 10 minutes. Uh, and there aren't. Um, uh, you, there are proofs of this that you can learn in a, a lifetime. There are proofs of this that you can learn in, in decades of study, if not a lifetime. And we're faced with the other difficulty that, and I'm talking about real proofs, but this should be cause for hope because there are real proofs, but it's just that coming to that type of certainty with reason alone, or insofar as reason can be isolated from anything else is no easy task. It takes a lifetime of study. And this is further complicated by the fact that we live in times where on a methodological level, a lot of people say, well, Kalam is not even possible. It's not even a possible science. The idea of proving the Aqidah is not even possible. No, proving the Aqidah is possible. Um, you can come to a certainty without years of study. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can grant it to you in a moment and you can receive it from um, a proof. But what I'm saying is if someone came along, you know, some d doing a bit of shaytana, uh, who's, who's, who studied philosophy for 30 years, they might be able to poke holes in what's caused that certainty in you. So when I'm saying a real demonstration, to be really uh, impervious to that, that's a, a lifetime of study, or a direct or a, 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 a degree of direct spiritual acquaintance with some of the haqqa'iq, which can render you impervious to the, to the rational argument. If you've experienced something, uh, it becomes as if the already knowledge. Um, and I don't mean some sort of vague hallucination. Uh, those who know, know, I'm told. So um, uh, that's a different order of knowledge entirely. It's not something which, which um, can be uh, 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 held to the standards of, 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 a, of a much more paltry experience, like sense experience or, to, or, or, or the processes of reason. And uh, although no, I'm not a huge fan of, of uh, Jordan Peterson, I'm certainly not a huge fan of Sam Harris. I did go to a Jordan Peterson um, lecture a couple of years ago with a friend uh, in this huge uh, auditorium where they just had um, Justin Bieber or something. And then suddenly they had Jordan Peterson with, with about 10,000 people there. And uh, Sam Harris was like, oh, well, you know, I've done Buddhist meditation, I've experienced that, it doesn't make me think that there's actually has to be a metaphysical reality there. And Jordan Peterson said something I really appreciated. He said, try a higher dose. And, and I think that's the clincher really. Uh, if, if you have an experience of truth, which makes everything else seem paltry, um, uh, in comparison, uh, if you have a direct experience of that light, it, you, you, it's not capable of, of being denied uh, by, by anything which is more limited uh, uh, in scope than itself. And so that's an important thing to realize. So uh, a, a certainty, a real certainty is possible without years of study. Um, it's not just a practical certainty like the fact that my buildings, my room is not gonna collapse on my head right now. It's a real certainty. Um, so very quickly, as we all memorize in our traditional studies, al-ilm in our tradition is sifatun tujibu tamyizan la yahtamilun naqid. And I've paraphrased this here saying, knowledge is the cognition 
of realities and truths in their intrinsic distinctness. We've got another spelling mistake, I'm afraid. In their intrinsic, don't know how I don't catch them, I do. Knowledge is a cognition of realities and truths in their intrinsic distinctness, so as to render the contradictories corresponding to those realities and truths strictly impossible. Now, I fear that's scarcely uh, clearer than the Arabic, um, but, but the point is, knowledge in our tradition, which, which is the same word uh, in, the, in the Western tradition, scientia is the same word, uh, obviously it's the same word as science. Science then becomes co-opted in the 19th century um, and monopolized by the natural sciences, which are very far from the idea of traditional science. Traditional science means certain knowledge, knowledge that the contradictory of which is, is impossible. So to, to make this a bit clear, clear, I'm having a very distinct experience of looking at myself and Camel at the moment on the screen. And I'm absolutely certain that that's me and that's Camel. And the contradictory of that, it's not Hassan and it's not Camel. It's, it's impossible because I'm, I'm, I'm directly uh, verifying this. I have a direct acquaintance with this truth. That distinct intrinsic distinctness of these two realities is imposed upon me. I can't consistently doubt it. In the Islamic tradition, this doesn't stop with sensible truths. This also includes logical principles like the whole is greater than the part, but also uh, uh, truths of aqidah, the, 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 the truths of our metaphysics, the truths that of, of, of the, of the objects of our faith. So the notion again in the widespread polemics of today that faith, as we mentioned last time, faith means blind faith. It means that you're believing in something just because you feel like it. And we'll get there literally just because you feel like it in the contemporary voluntarism that is so widespread. Ultimately, I have to respect you because you believe in something because you feel like it. And I have to honor that you're right to do so because the ultimate principle is the will, the pure will of the individual. And so your belief is no better than mine. I might think your belief is absurd, but ultimately mine's just a will and yours is just a will. So I have to respect that they're on a par. And so you have the type of polemic you had from Birch and Russell where you believe in God, you may as well believe there's a teapot circling one of the planets. You can believe that, but it's blind faith. You have no reason to believe it. Um, now, of course, this presupposes a long history of, of desperate uh, intellectual deterioration such that someone could get to the point where they, they draw any equivalence between a teapot um, uh, or any other random belief um, and uh, the ground, the, the, the ultimate principle of all determinate being, and the ground of all uh, finite existences. Uh, one is an arbitrary belief, and one is a belief without which nothing is intelligible. Is knowledge opposed to faith in our tradition? Oh, sorry. While in his summer, Aquinas tells that us that it is possible for the same person about one and the same object to know one thing and to think another. And in like manner, one may know by demonstration the unity of the Godhead and by faith, the Trinity, and also that faith is a mean between science and opinion. The definition of faith in Islamic theology, going back to the forefathers, the Salaf, is cognizance and knowledge, al-ma'rif al-ilm, as you'll find in, in Taftazani's Tahdib al-Kalam which was later formalized without a change in meaning in logical terms as knowledge to which one has had assent or tastiq, that is concerning which the necessity of intellectual certainty is obtained. This cannot be a mere matter of will. Sorry, I keep on swiping the wrong way. I mean this way. Uh, this cannot be a matter of will because one cannot truly choose to believe without having been moved to do so by an intellectual impetus of one form or another. Rather, when one takes the necessary steps to investigate the existence of God in accordance, of course, with one's intellectual ability, Islam does not ask all of the believers to become trained theologians, 
One will arrive at an unshakable certainty. The rigorously authenticated hadith concerning the miracles of the Holy Prophet وسلم, confer the same certainty on the contents of the Quran and the hadith. Had he not been, of course, not, in, not to be divorced from their experiential dimension, and it was never meant to be, because people were living and breathing in, in the barrack of Islamic societies. Had he not been a messenger sent by God, he would not have granted him miracles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not have granted him miracles, because God does not mislead the righteous. A few special souls may believe entirely on the grounds of direct, purely on the grounds of direct spiritual experience, yes. But this cannot be made the rule, because as, as a Sharif al jurjani tells us, the spiritual exercises of those who deny the truth of Islam amongst the Jews and Christians lead them to false creedal beliefs. It is necessary thus that spiritual exercises be accompanied by rational investigation. And so uh, ours, and this is an important uh, prerequisite to being able to study something called Aqidah or, or Alm al-Kalam in our time is to understand that we have, uh, I think I'll take another five minutes, we, we, we have uh, uh, mawana or obstacles in our way that weren't there before, for example, we don't, we're not always aware of it, but the standard philosophy in a, in a society which gives the impression of this overwhelming pluralism, no, I mean, you can't say anything standard, everything's there. No, the standard philosophy of, our, of, of, of academia is a methodological skepticism which uh, inclines towards subjectivism. Um, and we're not gonna go into the reasons for that, but broadly speaking, our tradition is realist and the, 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 the dominant philosophy of modernity is subjectivist. And what that basically means is that we have a world, conception of a world or a real world and the broad uh, notion of how we come to know that world on the realist account is that that world comes to us in a sense, we passively receive within our cognitive apparatuses the world as it really is, distinct in itself. And the broad notion of subjectivism, uh, which we all, we're all influenced by, is the notion that there isn't really anything out there distinct in itself. Rather, there is there what our cognitive apparatuses project because we are a particular type of human being. If an alien was to look at the world, he might see something completely different. So I can't say there really is a world. That's one of the arguments, the types of arguments which you use. I can't say there really is a world in there uh, uh, irrespective of, of, uh, of the particularities of my, or not shaped by the particularities of my cognitive apparatus. And um, apparatuses and uh, another very strong uh, consequence of that that basic assumption is the idea that all we re all that's really there, all that I really have direct access to, is a pure naked will, which is simply there's nothing really distinct out there that I can know for certain is not shaped by my, by the particular form of my cognitive apparatus is. But what I do know is that I have a, I have the ultimate uh, ability because I can directly experience it to determine the way that I want to look at the world, the shape that my life is going to be. And I have this kind of radical self-determination, radical voluntarism. Voluntarism again is the idea that, one way of explaining it is that will is radically prior to essence. So it's like Sartre says, uh, there's no human nature. Uh, 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 being precedes essence. Man, the individual human being is just a pure being. He's not even a human, he's not even an individual, but he makes his own existence. And then we create, we construct all of the realities that we then think are so concrete on this point of view, actually they are concrete, but we, we, we construct all of these realities uh, and this constructivism um, uh, is uh, 
basically founded on on that uh, notion of voluntarism, which we all recognize um, this assumption of a voluntaristic assumption. Um, and, and we recognize, of course, the uh, the earth out of that in broad postmodernism today. So um, I believe it's constructionism, actually. It's, uh, the, there's a, people have to mix up constructionism and constructivism to do different things. The neutrality of the state on matters of religious truth can only reinforce the impression the average man or woman already has from the scientific claims of their education elsewhere that religion is simply a matter of personal preference on which logic can have no bearing, inherently unprovable, and again, fundamentally subjective. As Gregory has it, subjective individual preference seems to be the extent of any foundation for answers to the life questions amid our hyperpluralism. For them, the basis for such answers in Western society today is literally arbitrary in the etymological sense. It is a function of the arbitrium, the individual human will, Modern liberal states protect exactly that arbitrariness. Rather than being encouraged to sanctify our souls, all of the texts apart from the quotes, something I've written, rather than being encouraged to sanctify our souls by conforming them to revealed truth or divine law as most traditional societies, as in most traditional societies, I haven't edited terribly carefully, sorry about that. Almost everything in the environment in modern liberal states is designed to reassure us that it is the individual self not the divine beyond our limited selves that is the primary, truly real, or even only reality. Because according to this modern epistemology, religious, religions cannot possibly admit of either affirmative or negative proof. Their only possible use becomes as a form of therapy, whether simply to reduce anxiety or to help us create a sense of greater purpose for our lives. The supreme value, and this is beautiful, this is my favorite quote, the supreme val value, says Gregory, and you can see this everywhere around you, the supreme value, says Gregory, is individual choice per se, regardless of what is chosen. We end up, as it says in this book, with an ideal in which there are as many religions as there are individuals. The core underlying ideas constituting American religious individualism are that each individual is uniquely distinct from all others and deserves a faith that fits his or her singular self, that individuals must freely choose their own religion the individual is the authority over religion and not vice versa. The religion need not be practiced in and by a community. That no person may exercise judgments about or attempt to change the faith of other people. And that religious beliefs, beliefs are ultimately interchangeable insofar as what matters is not the integrity of a belief system, but the comfort, comfortability of the individual holding specific religious beliefs. So I'll save for next time, uh, uh, hopefully not to leave us on a cliff edge, but uh, I'll save for next time our response to that um, because we run out of time. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for, for bearing with me again. And Jazakallah khairan, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa sallam. A'udhu billahi s-sami al-alim min shaytan al-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد المصطفى النبي الأمي الطيب الطاهر الزكي صلاة تنحل بالعقد وتنفرج بالكرب على آله وأصحابه أجمعين He is one in his essence without partner soul without likeness independent and eternally besought without opposite alone without counterpart and he is one, beginninglessly eternal, having had no first moment, for everlasting, having had no beginning, perpetually existent, and he will have no last moment, sempiternal, and he will have no end. Of course, the whole foundation and the whole basis of our belief is our recognition that beyond the world of appearances, but beyond the world of phenomena, we recognize a transcendent 
source of all those limited beings and that reality is not exhausted by any finite description of it and that underlying every determination and by determination i mean everything that exists that we know of directly is limited it's not infinite it it represents a limited instantiation of, of particular properties whenever there is something which is determinate it's only possible because there is something which is indeterminate that constitutes the grounds of that thing and it's not that that thing is entirely indeterminate but it's rather that it's not determinate in the way in the same way as its individuals are and underlying the world there is an ultimate principle of unity there is a necessary being not conceived anthropomorphically but not conceived entirely negatively either so imam al ghazali says he is one in his essence without partner soul without likeness independent and eternally besought without opposite so samad in surat al ikhlas we have qul huwallahu ahad allah samad that most beautiful epitome of of aqidah about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is independent he's prior to all things there's nothing with him and he's eternally besought because everything is subordinate to him everything stands in need of him uh for its being for its existence for its nature and for the fulfillment of its nature we don't only uh stand in total poverty before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of our existence he brought us into existence but also in terms of the realization of our life's purpose and in terms of realizing the fullness of our natures um and so that you know these profound matters are contained in the the divine name al samad without opposite there's no he doesn't stand in relation allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anything else he is in himself entirely alone there's nothing with him with respect to himself he's created the world and the world is other than him uh but it's not with him uh uh as part of his essence um and so alone without counterpart and he is one beginninglessly eternal having had no first moment what's beginninglessly eternal this is a negation of time it's not saying that he's in time and he's always been there at the beginning but it's saying that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists entirely outside of space and time he didn't come into existence well who created god then well to ask that question means that we don't we haven't understood the proper contours of of what we're speaking about at all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside of time and space causal relations coming into existence being caused being the effect of something uh our 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 temporal relations um and they presuppose time we are talking about a being who is outside of those causal relations coming into existence being caused by something else being prior to something that is of the same nature that you cause all of those ways of thinking are created by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he stands outside of any of those possible relations and so when we say who created god then you're saying he he's beginninglessly eternal well how did he get there well allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is not of the type of of uh, contingent being that that got there. He, he, he's outside of those causal relations of, and, and outside of space and time. I think it's very clear from the from looking around us that uh, that, that, that the rest of and from Rahma, Assalamu alaikum, how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of causal relations in his act of creation and determination? Does he create causal relations in time without them causally relating back to him? How is he related to his control of temporal events? Rahma is our physicist and she always asks difficult questions. Um, how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of causal relations in act of creation and determination? Yeah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, causal relations pertain between things of the same nature. The act of creation is not the same, of the same uh, quality as the, uh, the, uh, a, a finite effect being traceable to a, a finite cause which is of the same nature. So when we're talking about creation ex nihilo, we're talking about what we understand by causality completely breaks down. So I can't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the order of uh, causal entities, because what I understand by causality is something which only makes sense uh, in terms of uh, the causal relations which obtain between finite beings. It doesn't mean, and this is because we're on the transcendence part, it doesn't mean there isn't, of course, we say, we, we say Allah SWT is fa'alun lima yurid. So it shouldn't have been understood that what I meant is that he, that he has nothing to do with causality whatsoever. Allah SWT is the cause of the world. But our concepts of causality refer to causality that take place uh, between two things which are the, 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 the same degree of being. My parents are the cause of my existence, for example, um, and so on. And so uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, I mean, when we look from the perspective, we can't, I mean, you know, what, what audacity would, would claim to look at things from God's perspective, except a, a very unwise one. But, uh, but, but I think that the, in terms of understanding the mysteries of of what creation means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, again, it's, it's very unlike causality in the sense that, you know, I set uh, a particular action in motion um, uh, that uh, intrinsically, there's something about it that results in, in this, this effect. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need tools uh, he doesn't lack everything or everything is already present. So what I'm trying to say is God didn't create in the sense that uh, in the sense we create something because we, you know, we want something extra. We don't already have it. Otherwise we wouldn't bother creating it. Allah SWT already has everything. We already exist in his knowledge eternally because we are consequences of his self-knowledge. In his infinity, he also knows the infinity of possible objects of knowledge. And that can be dealt with in, in further detail, but in his infinity, he also knows the infinity of the possible objects of knowledge. Creation, certainly on the Akbari point of view, means those distinct objects in his knowledge coming to knowledge of themselves when they become self-consciousness, self-conscious. Actually, that's just an unfolding of the potential that's already there in the knowledge that Allah SWT has of us eternally. But Allah SWT doesn't lack anything. So he doesn't gain anything by creating. So it's not the same uh, causal relation that uh, is that obtains when we're talking about causality between finite objects. The, the problem of the single ground of all of existence is a is a ever present conundrum uh, for, 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 for any thinking human being. Even on the naturalist point of view, you say, well, you know, it's not any one of them in particular. And if it's not any one of them in particular, it can't be the aggregate of them either. 
because they don't have any power together that they don't have as individuals. He is one beginningly eternal, having had no first moment, for everlasting, having had no beginning, perpetually existent, and you'll have no last moment, sempiternal, and you'll have no end. So he's also, his, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence is also, uh, it's, it's also abadi, not only azali. So uh, uh, his existence is also post-eternal or sempiternal. Uh, now, sempiternality and beginningless, beginningless eternity, again, are not, don't refer to different times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside of those, but it, it's referring to, from our perspective, we're talking about existence without end. It can't have an end because it doesn't exist within space and time. Perpetually existent, he will have no last moment. Sempiternal, and he will have no end. The self-subsistent sustainer for whom there is no cessation. Al-Qayyum, the self-subsistent sustainer, just as uh, Al-Samad can't really be... Um, uh, can't really be translated with any less than the independent and eternally besought. Those uh, meanings are ir irreducibly there. Um, we have the same with uh, Al Qayyum, uh, which really does irreducibly contain self subsistent and sustainer, um, uh, as one will discover uh, in the various uh, shuroh of the divine names that are available. So the self-subsistent sustainer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't require anything in order to exist. We all require, we have layers and layers and layers of contingency and of requiring something beyond ourselves on so many different levels. And I'm not talking just on the strictly metaphysical level that we require someone to cause our existence to preponderate over our non-existence, which are both possible things. So why is it we exist rather than not exist? I don't mean just on that level. Obviously, there are so many layers of dependence that we possess on our parents and our environment and on our formation, whether it's intellectual or, or, or moral or on just the conditions of our material subsistence. But Allah standing outside of those relations, being a, a pure unity, doesn't require any of that. He doesn't stand in those causal relations. So we're trying to, very much of this is negative theology, we're trying to point out something that is the ultimate reality, but by saying, well, it can't be understood uh, in any of the finite ways which uh, would usually uh, render something knowable or intelligible to us. Um, what we really want is to uncover the presence of God. That's what's behind uh, all of this theologizing. And we'll discuss later how it's not really possible to divorce the experiential aspect from the, uh, from the rational dimension uh, and and if it's arguable that it's possible i don't think it's desirable but the self-subsistent sustainer for whom there is no cessation everlasting never ceasing always has he been characterized by the attributes of majesty so will it be forever unterminated by ex extinction nor severance by the passing away of infinite durations or the perishing of terms appointed. But he is the first and the last and the outward and the inward. And he, and he has knowledge of all things. So I, I broadly group these under the divine essence because these aren't about any name in particular. Um, uh, so uh, these are the first two pages. Then on the third page, um, 
the, the theme here is certainly the transcendence of the last Manitada. Uh, in theology, we speak of the transcendence of God and we also speak of the imminence of God. And the transcendence is, is usually related to uh, uh, apophatic uh, theology, which, which is the via negativa, as in uh, coming to a theological knowledge of the nature of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via negation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not, he's an existent. So it's not, it's not a pure negation. He's the existent, the truly existent the sole true existence, but we're limiting these uh, uh, determinate forms. We're negating these determinate forms of him, um, where any, anything which is determinate, as in anything which is, is, you know, has a, a, particular, a particular description, an exhaustive particularized description, can't be God because it's a creation, it's a creation of God, it's created by God. It's a determinate form. We can safely say that anything of that nature can't be the nature of God. He's the source of those properties and that description, but he's not, he can't be characterized in his essence because the determinate is by nature created and the created is by nature, not God. So the transcendence and that he is not a body shaped into form, nor a substance limited and determinate, and that he bears no resemblance to bodies, neither in being determinate, nor in being receptive to division, and that he is not a substance, nor do substances inhere within him, nor an accident, and accidents do not inhere within him. So there's a few uh, philosophical terms here that we should discuss. Um, he is not a, a body shaped into form. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't possess extension. So, so bodies, there, there are all sorts of different definitions of body, which we won't go into, but, but generally as an extended substance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not extended, or extension as a, as a determinate property is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an extension, an extended being. We're, we're extended beings, um, shaped into form, nor a substance limited and determinate. Now, what is a substance? It's a very alien word to our modern ears and a very, very basic word in the traditional senses. Um, Again, we won't go into the um, uh, questions of the, the, the very intricate questions of, of its uh, differences of opinion about its definition. Um, but uh, if you want to note anything down, I would say it's a substance in Islamic tradition is is a maujud, an existent thing, la fi maudor. So it's an existing thing which uh, doesn't exist in a substratum distinct from itself. It is the substratum. So the substratum of the accidents of, you know, the color of my hat, uh, the color of the books, um, the uh, particular dimensions of the, of the bookshelf, uh, all of the varying sensible qualities of, of, of this waistcoat, whatever, uh, those are all accidents in hearing in a substratum. The substratum is the hat, not the color. The substratum is the face, sorry to be self-referential, but the, the substratum is the face, not the, the color of the face. The substratum is the, is the jacket, not the, the color, um, and so on. Um, so in the Islamic tradition, or the recognized within Islamic intellectual traditions, broadly speaking, the 10 Aristotelian categories are, are broadly recognized. If this is new to everyone and you're interested, um, uh, it's a very basic understanding for the, um, 
for all sorts of different applications in the Islamic sciences. Uh, but the, the 10 categories which were originally enumerated by Aristotle uh, in, in our tradition, al-maqulat, not al-maqulat, al-maqulat, al-ashr, are summed up in a famous poem which says, Zaydun al-tawil al-azraq ibn maliki fi baytihi bil amsi kana muttaki bi yadihi ghusnun lawahu faltawa. Um, and that's the substance of the, uh, of the poem. So it says, Zayd, Zayd is a substance. Zayd, it means an individual human being. You could say Kamil, could say Hassan, uh, whatever. So uh, Zayd is a substance. That's the substratum of all the accidents. Now you're going to have all the accidents. Just so, this is, so this is to get across the idea of substance and accident. Also to give some impression that even in a very basic aqidah, we can't, it's not really separable from the intellectual context, which is not our intellectual context today. So uh, Zayd and al-Tawil. So Zayd, al-Tawil, the tall person, and Tawil is from the category of kam, it's from the category of quantity, because uh, it refers to a quantitative property uh, in the sense that it's determinate and measurable. Zayd um, al-Tawil al-Azraq, the blue, perhaps he's wearing a blue hat or something, I don't know how he could be blue. Zayd al-Tawil al-Azraq, that's kaif, that's quality. So it's not quantifiable in the same way. Zayd al-Tawil al-Azraq, Zayd al-Tawil al-Azraq ibn Maliki, the son of Malik, that's relation. So he's related to something outside of himself because he's the son of Malik. Fi beitihi, in his house, that's place, makan. Bil amps, yesterday, time. Kana muttaki, he was uh, reclining or he was, he was leaning on something. Kana muttaki. That's position or wada. Biyadihi rusnun. In his hand, there was a uh, a twig. Lawahu. So that's biyadihi rusnun is possession or milk. Lawahu. He uh, twisted it over. Lawahu faltawa. He bent it over. Faltawa. So it became bent. The first is fi'l, which is uh, action. And the second is infi'al, which is being acted upon, or in the kind of archaic term, affection with an A. So those, those nine are all accidents. The only one that's a substance is Zaid, because he's the substratum of all of those accidents. All of those accidents are inhering in him, or they're, um, they're referring to the relations that he's when you put any human being in, in a concrete situation with all the other things around him, we're, we're, we're uh, immediately standing in all sorts of different types of relations to the other things about us. But last man's hand is not a substance. Even, why is it particularly negated? Because you might think, well, a last man's hand exists and he's not in a substratum. That's the definition of, of, of substance. But he's not a, he's not a, uh, uh, he's not a substance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because although he's an existent, and so in some sense there's an ambiguity, he seems to be covered by the definition, but, but he's not, it's not relevant to talk in language of substrata, because a substratum is something which is, has the uh, qabiliya, the capability to receive accidents, to be the substratum of accidents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't be the substratum of anything, um, uh, because accidents determine the nature of the substratum. They limit the nature of the substratum. All accidents by nature are limited in themselves in accordance with the intrinsic capacity to instantiate them, to receive them, that the uh, substratum, whatever it is, the substratum might be Kermit, might be Hassan, so I can't have more blue there than, than the, the substratum is able to receive. So it's determinate and it's determinate, but, but uh, 
any property uh, uh, limits the substratum. Um, and so the, the idea of substrata and actions is, is, isn't intelligible in in, with respect to a lot of matter. Nor is substance limited and determinate and that he bears no resemblance to bodies, neither in being determinate nor in being receptive, receptive to division. And that he is not a substance, nor do substances inhere within him, nor an accident, and accidents do not inhere within him. Nay, he bears no likeness to any existing thing, nor does any existing thing resemble him. So we have that very extraordinary verse in the Quran, the Thun regime, Laysa Kamislihi Shay wa huwa Samir al Basir. So there is nothing, absolutely nothing like unto him. And yet he is the seeing and the hearing. And so this is this perfect uh, juxtaposition of transcendence and imminence, tenzih wa teshbih, which we'll discover, we'll, we'll discuss in more detail. Today we're focusing in on the, the tenzih aspect more. Um, so again, uh, who created God? Creation is an act within time or pertaining rather to temporal uh, beings coming into existence, having not existed. And those causal relations are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that doesn't mean thinking on the that, which is prohibited, is quite a different thing. Uh, but when we think, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, uh, the, the modern uh, shubhas, well, how, did, how did he get there? Because we're thinking in terms of, of causal relations. Sure, there's an eternal being, but how did he get there? Uh, you know, and so, you know, what created God? And then what created that? And then what created that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't stand in those relations. And, and, and that knowledge, that realization via contemplation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're talking about the ground of all being, which is outside of coming into existence and being the cause of something of the same nature as the caused uh, and uh, of coming out of existence and of depending on something else to come into existence, We're talking about something entirely different. And that knowledge is a, an experience before it is an intellectual awareness. It's an experience because that that reality has a presence. And it's very key to be able to break out. That's why I thank those who ask the question. And it's actually mentioned in Hadith, this question, who created God in a Sahih Hadith. And uh, there's a, the Prophet Islam's response uh, is an extraordinary response because it contains great power and, and is, is greatly subtle. And I think we'll, once I, get the reference and everything for that for inshallah next time. We'll look at that. But I thank those who ask that question because if you haven't thought through that question and understood why the question doesn't apply without just saying, oh, because he's eternal, they haven't understood the question. But really, well, how did Allah SWT get there? He's outside of causal relations. Co the coming into existence and causality are created by Allah SWT. He's the ground of all existence beyond time and space, that's what we're talking about here. The ultimate principle of unity of all being, infinite. And uh, so he is not a substance, nor do substances inhere within him, nor an accident, and accidents do not inhere within him. Nay, he bears no likeness to any existing thing, nor does any existing thing resemble him. There is none like unto him, nor is he similar to aught. He is not circumscribed by extension. I'm limited by my extension. Nor contained by dimensions. I'm contained by dimensions. He is not encompassed by directions, unlike us, nor enclosed by the earths and the heavens. He is established on the throne. And it says in the Quran, Thumma stawa al arsh. Using temporal language. So there are certain 
tensions that I wouldn't say intrinsically in, 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 exist in, this, in the Quran or in the scripture, more broadly the Quran and the Hadith, but that uh, have to be mentioned in Aqa'id because of the tensions that surrounded their interpretation in the early centuries. So he is established on the throne in the manner in which he said it, in the sense that he intended it. So that's the first thing. He's established on the throne in the manner in which he said it, in the sense he intended it. That's the way of the Salaf. But we don't stop there because there's certain things we also know about the last Mahajala. While we, we affirm the Istiwa al Arsh, like the, 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 the madhab of the Salaf, we also say, and this is what is Ashari about it, an establishment transcendent far beyond adjacency or physical contact, another way of saying that, or coming to settle, obtaining in a place indwelling and motion, because we, all, we know because of that master verse of the Tanzir, Laysa Kamithlihi Shait, there is nothing whatsoever like unto him, that none of those properties can possibly apply. None of those predicates can possibly apply. And this is the middle way that Imam al-Ash'ari, and this is his great importance. Imam al-Ash'ari did not found a school of philosophy. And so you have a lot of flag-bearing Ash'aris today going around saying that we're Ash'aris and this is the Ash'ari perspective. And you know, Ibn Arabi is not an Ash'ari and this person is not an Ash'ari. And you know, we have to hold fast to the true Ash'arism. Uh, Ash'arism is not a school of philosophical thought. It's a school of creed. And it, in that sense, it's absolutely necessary, absolutely valid, and was a great benefit to the, to the Muslims uh, uh, at a, a time of, of great danger and dissension. And the Maturidi creed uh, is, does the same work. And so it's perfectly acceptable also to, to ex adopt the Maturidi creed, which is almost identical, um, but has a slight difference of uh, principle, which results in slightly different uh, results, uh, sl slightly different conclusions, which in many cases are actually, um, in our contemporary circumstances, can be more attractive and I think can be more appropriate to the particular intellectual challenges that we're facing at the moment. Ashadism can be uh, interpreted in too much of a voluntaristic uh, direction, but we'll, we'll discuss that later. Um, so it's a, it's a school of creed. What Imam al Ashari did is he, he said, the Mu'tazila, the, the dominant school of creed before Imam al Ashari came along, are constantly telling us that no, you know, this can't be the meaning of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends because it's it's conflicting with my aql, my intellectual system, which which I've decided is is absolute. You know, there can't be uh, uh for example. That's impossible. So it can't be literal. Um whereas uh, it says in the Quran, there's an there's an explicit text that we're going to see Allah subhanahu wa in the Akhirah. Wujuhi yawma idhun nadira ila rabbiha nadira. So, uh, uh, so uh, Imam al-Ashari was able to find a middle way between saying, uh, sure, there are certain things we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the aql, that he's laysa kamithli, he's shaykh. That's known through aql and through anas, in fact, because it's laysa kamithli, he's shaykh, is anas from the Quran. But uh, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is not a finite being. Uh, from the principles given to us in, in, that we innately have in, in our aql, our first principle tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be a determinate being, because the determinate uh, needs to be rendered determinate by something other than itself, just to give one very basic reason. Um, and yet, our we don't smother the text of revelation 
with our rational principles. And that's what Imam Ashray brought. He brought a faithfulness to the letter of the Quranic text and of, of the, uh, the, 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 the data of revelation more broadly uh, and brought that into harmony with the requirements of intellect. And he rooted that process in the Quran itself. He said that the Quran itself is, is directing us to do this process of nadar. And we'll discuss that next time, actually, because there's some very interesting texts about the exact Quranic texts Imam al Ashri used to ground the, uh, the, 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 the process of nadar, which is speculative investigation, rational investigation in the Quran as a Quranic directive. Um, and so we don't just say, well, he's established on the throne Bila Kaif only. We say, it's, we say it's in the manner in which he intended, but we know that it's not in this way. So there's a balance there. The, the Maratasilas, on the other hand, broadly speaking as a school, would not say in the manner that he intended. They just say this definitely doesn't mean such and such. Um, and so there's an important but subtle difference because what you're leaving open is the possibility of having direct acquaintance with the reality, with the reality and, and the Ashari Madhab, usually mistaken for being overly rationalistic, a direct acquaintance with something which is beyond the rational prescriptions that we've imposed upon the text. So he is established on the throne. We'll, dis we'll discuss that more next time. He is established on the throne in the manner in which he said it, in the sense that he intended it, an establishment transcendent far beyond adjacency or coming to settle, obtaining in a place indwelling and in motion. The throne bears him not. Nay, the throne and its bearers are borne aloft by the gentle grace of his power and helplessly overcome in his grasp. He is beyond the throne and the heavens beyond all things to the ends of the earth, a beyondness that does not increase him in proximity to the throne in the heavens, just as it does not increase him in distance from the earth. Nay, he is exalted beyond all the orders of being, beyond the throne and the heavens, just as he ex is, is exalted beyond all of the orders of being, it is repeated twice, beyond the earth. And this is very important because in the hierarchical scheme of, of, of existence recognized in the Islamic tradition, Rafi' uh, al-Darajat, Rafi' al-Darajat dhul arsh, wa fawqa kulli dhi almin alim. It's not to be understood that there's just this pyramid of existence, hasha lillah, far be it from Allah, and that God is just at the top and is somehow continuous with that hierarchy. He's transcendent beyond that hierarchy of being that he has nonetheless established. Uh, and and he, so he's not closer to the heaven than he is to the earth. Yet even so, he is near to every existing thing, closer indeed to the servant should be then, if you could make that change, I'd appreciate it, then the vein in the neck. So Habl uh, al-Warid, uh, can be translated the jugular vein. Um, but when we reflect on that, Allah is closer to us than the vein in our neck. He is with you wherever you are. Not, not in a physical uh, nearness, but in, in, in the nearness that we are in Allah's knowledge. Right now we're in Allah's knowledge entirely dependent upon Allah for, for, for everything. Within him we live and move and have our being. I think it's fine to say. <laughs>